So let's get started. So this is the Your Five-Year Plan Next Generation. If you notice, we're not in studio, yeah. right? We're not in studio because uh, we had the governor and a bunch of people here today. We're actually down at our intern headquarters in Rapid City, South Dakota. And behind me is our wonderful wall of FUD and uh, just our buzzword board. Buzzword board. <laughs> so if you're trying to look through this, trying to find things like passwords or meaning and information security, yeah, have fun with that. It's not going to get you anywhere. But I think it's it's apt, Sierra, because this right here is a bunch of crap that if people are getting started in computer security, they would try to automatically jump into buzzwords like artificial intelligence and machine learning and blockchain and all of these different things. And there's value, but that's not a good place to start your career uh, at all. So we wanted to cover good places and ways to start your career. And I thought I would bring in Randy Marchini. Uh, who has a tremendous background in starting careers in computer security, and Ed Capizzi, who helped launch my career in computer security to just drop in every once in a while. So my background, college was at University of Wyoming initially, went to Accenture, Northrop Grumman, started working on classified projects, started teaching for SANS, and started Black Hills Information Security. I don't want to spend too terribly, uh, too, too much time on this as a whole because there's other things that I want to get to, and I talked a lot more about that in my previous session. But it's interesting because when we're looking at computer security, especially for the old people that have been doing this for like 15, 20, or Randy's uh, case, 30 years, um, you don't really have a straight path to getting into information security. Uh, I would say, Randy, I'd love to get your opinion on this. It, you know, Even 10 years ago, we were always suspect of anybody that came out of college and wanted to go right into computer security. There was this huge kind of focus on coming up through the school of hard knocks and getting into computer security rather than just getting a degree, but you're working with degree program level students that are going right into computer security. Do you see that changing in the industry as a whole that now you can actually make that progression from university, get a master's degree or undergrad degree and get into computer security? Or do you think that there's still a lot of the school of hard knocks requirements involved? Um, there, there's still a lot of school of hard knocks requirements. I, I think a lot of universities now have started to realize that hands-on experience is something that's really, really valuable. Um, you know, it, it started off if you said computer security. My, my degrees are in electrical engineering and computer science. And, and if you said cybersecurity back then, they would hand you a crypto book and <laughs> say, here's, here's cryptography. Um, one thing that we've done here, so I, I'm the CISO at Virginia Tech, so my team runs all the cyber defense for the university, but we, we have a lab that the analysts use, and we opened up that lab to research and projects by undergrads and graduate students. So we basically uh, uh, converted it into a teaching hospital where I'm, I'm short-staffed, I need some bodies to do some stuff, students need some practical experience and, and real world real world applications. And so th that's what the purpose of the lab is. And so if the kids that come out, and, and I say kids, but graduate students or the undergrads that come out, uh, they, they've actually had hands-on experience using Snort, using Bro, using NetFlow, Argus, all these types of NetFlow tools and working on real life attacks because we see those every day. Mm -hmm. So hands-on experience is really, really valuable. Uh, and with, with the CTF competitions, net wars, and those things that like with, and the stuff that you guys do, uh, you know, uh, uh, your, your hacking thing coming up, uh, 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 that is a huge thing that students like to go, the, the, the cons, of, you know, the schmoo cons and those type of things. I think the important thing is if you're a student at a university that doesn't have the resources or the kind of the vision of something like, like Virginia Tech, or MIT has a pretty good program, Stanford does as well. Those those different capture the flag events, those things that we're doing at Waldo's Hackenfest are available and they're freely available for people that are coming up through the university system. You don't have to stay just in the university system for your learning, you can branch out as well. Absolutely, absolutely correct. I mean, uh, a lot of these, they're open to the general public. Uh, there's a big push to get K through 12 uh, uh, kids involved. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on here is the Virginia Cyber Range which uh, it, it's it's more of a, it, it's not a, a true range like everybody thinks it might be from the sound, but we're collecting course materials that teachers can use at the high school level. Uh, uh, it, it's basically out in the cloud. You set up your learning environments you, that way. What's the URL for that, Randy? The URL is, it's all, all one word, virginiacyberrange.org. 
The last thing I'll say about it is this solved a big problem that high schools had with cybersecurity education, because another program that, that the feds have, have started is a program called Gen Cyber, where, where you teach high school teachers how, to, how about fundamentals of computer security. They get jazzed up and they go back to their high schools and they're ready to teach a class and they want to get that lab hooked up to the Internet. And their IT guys say, no way in hell are you going to hook up a lab of hacking machines into my school network. Um, yeah. All right, cool. So I'm going to come back to you here in just a second, uh, Randy. Um, so I'll jump over to Ed. When I met Ed, I was a university student at uh, Denver University. He was a professor there. And I was caught up in the middle of the Indian Trust Settlement uh, computer security case. And a lot of this information is actually publicly available online. You can go and you can pull down all kinds of information about it. And uh, actually, if you go to the Indian Trust Settlement website, there's a lot of documents, uh, historical documents from the early 2000s. And Ed was someone that was kind of a surprise to me because Ed, I think at the time you were working at, was it Coal Fire that you were working at whenever you were a professor? I know that you did a transition in there as well. Yeah, yeah, I was starting, I was at Coal Fire getting ready to move to Chapa. Yep, and the idea of computer security as a profession outside of like working in the government as it was with Accenture, you were you were kind of on the ground floor of doing security consulting uh, back in the early 2000s. Have you seen anything kind of change since then uh, coming up to today whenever you're looking at computer security consulting? Because you've been a consultant, you've actually been working with companies, you've been on both sides of the fence for quite some time. Well, the, the change has been huge, John. I mean, you've, uh, you hit the nail on the head earlier when initially uh, a lot of the consultants or anyone who was working in security got there through a very securitous route. You know, normally they had a technical background and at some point somebody had said, um, we just bought this thing called a firewall. We want you to run it. Good luck. Uh, you know, so that has changed all the way through people now coming up, um, programs like yours, uh, Sands, the webcast that Black Hills do, they're teaching people about these concepts way early. And so it is not unusual to have someone come up and say, hey, look, I was kind of studying to be a DBA in college, ran into these you know, different resources, and this looks like, like a lot cooler way to get into IT. What do you think? Well, what am I going to say? Yeah, of course. That and the fact that you no longer have to have a small fortune to have the hardware to build a lab in your own, you know, to have a lab that you can be in full control of to start practicing some of these things. That's so let's talk huge. about let's talk about that lab and that practice, right? So what I said in the previous webcast was year one, you've got to focus on core concepts. Uh, Ed has this quote uh, that everyone should steal and you should print it out, and it stuck with me for a long time. It says, good computer security is nothing but an inspired ap application of the fundamentals. It's not about being lead. It's not about zero days. It's not wizards per uh, you know, trying to impress other wizards. It's just having a good understanding of the key fundamental concepts for Windows, for Linux, for networking. For, I recommend Python as a starting language. And I would also go so far as to say the benchmark standards. It, it's a great place for someone to learn an operating system by going through the CIS benchmark standards. And we can have long arguments about whether or not those standards are relevant to modern attackers, whether it would actually stop. I, I honestly don't care. But for me, learning coming up, uh, Randy, you remember years ago, back in 2000, they were coming up with the standards for Windows 2000, the standards for Red Hat at SANS, and then that basically uh, spun off into Center for Internet Security. I, I can't remember which one came first. But when we're looking at year one, learning your core operating systems, learning some basic security fundamentals and way that you look at those operating systems, getting started with the language. Is there anything that you all would recommend that we would we should add to somebody for like building up a lab for year one? So, anything. all right, so we'll start with Randy. Randy, is there anything that you would add or kind of, you know, kind of bring to the table here about these core fundamentals, networking, operating systems, and getting started on coding? Uh, you need a fundamental understanding of TCP IP. Uh, and, and ICMP, at least at least those three protocols, you definitely need uh, a good understanding of it. You need a, a good understanding of of you know how to um, uh, of what I call the SEC 503 of uh, intrusion de uh, you know defense packet. Yeah, reason. all about packets, right? How to read a packet. It is all about packets uh, at that level. That's the supplemental knowledge in addition to like what you said 
being a good Windows admin, being a good Linux admin. I, I started off as a as a, a Unix ad, a sysadmin, and so you know, knowing how to rebuild systems, patch systems, uh, understand what the network connections are, sockets, all that. Socket programming is another thing that you that you might want to you know a, a skill that you might want to work on as well. Yeah, and uh, I would put that in. like you said, Python. And it's tough because a lot of people, when they think of Python, you go through the standard books on Python and they're like, we're going to build a battleship game. Um, but I would say specifically, if you're looking at something like Python, learning how to do sockets and making TCP connections, UDP connections, doing things like that, maybe starting with Scapy framework or yep. Scapy uh, would be a good way to go as well. Ed, your take on this. Is there anything that you'd like to kind of bring to enlighten this particular slide in this particular section? Yeah, the one thing I would add is if you can find an old copy of the um, four inch thick TCP IP book. Stevens. Yeah, yep. get that book, read through it. Um, it's painful, but when you come out the other end, it's awesome to have that kind of a background. And then the other thing that I would add to this is while people are learning, you know, focusing on these hard skills, start your education on the soft skills. How are these machines used in business? What are people doing with them? Because um, how they're used in the business can be just as important when it comes down to tracing the wire and understanding the technology as the hardcore tech. Yeah, and if you can't speak the business speak, I, this is another thing that you talked about years ago as a consultant coming into Denver University with that program. If you can't speak the business speak, and Randy's talked about the exact same thing for years, if you can't talk to business executives, to people that are making decisions about where money is going to go, you're going to go nowhere. You can be as technical as anybody else out there, but if you can't understand the application of what you're trying to do, then you're not going to get very far. So do we have any questions we'd like to hit or are you um, think we're doing all right? Derek just wanted to make a point. Um, he says, hello, I was at Black Hat this year. One of the best things I gained from that con was approaching John about an internship and he replied do you know programming are you good with python it got me knowing even though most say it's not a prerequisite in infosec i believe it is a need because it helps in the long run i'm currently learning python and it's going to help in the field so thank you fantastic so randy kick it over to you because you work a lot with interns not just like standard interns at virginia tech you have some amazing interns is it possible to sit and work with you as an intern if i don't know how to code is that something that you would even consider uh, for an intern in your team? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the background. The, the thing that we really look for is, is a, a, an aptitude. Um, I was really, really lucky. One of my professors when I was an undergrad was actually one of the code breakers in, in, for the Enigma in World what? War II. <laughs> what? And so, you, know, you always want me to say that you, you're not that old in the industry, but you literally had someone that worked with you that broke codes on the Enigma. I, I, J, I J Good, uh, Jack Good, G, G O O D, was a statistics professor here at Virginia Tech. And, uh, and I had asked him, I mean, years later after everything was declassified, I said, you know, you guys were first order mathematicians. What, but the rest of us, you know, what, what did you look for? And he, and he said, we looked for a certain aptitude. They picked on crossword puzzles, uh, uh, champions, because it's, a, it's a, an ability to extract. Uh, uh, information from small clues, you know, a 13 letter word that starts with an A and ends with an N and you go, oh, attenuation, you know, and, and the rest of us That's are like, I would what? Say. <laughs> that would have been the first one I jumped to. Yeah, you know, you, you go, what? You know, uh, that, that and the ability to, you know, just to be persistent and not give up. And so if, if I find a student that's got those, those abilities, I can teach them the, the Python stuff. I, I'll just give them a book and they'll take off with it. So yeah. it's that ability to look at something and 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 really in a way, um, a, a Schneier wrote a, 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 a an essay called "Inside the Twisted Mind of a Security Professional," and in there he basically says that engineers are trained to build things that work. Security engineers misuse those things to break them, mm -hmm. and so it's that attitude that that we look for. And, and those are the guys that are at the top of the pyramid that will become the tool tool builders. But so one last thing, the ability to speak in public is a key thing. And, and for anybody, do a talk at the cons, do a talk at your at your events, do a talk anywhere and get practice on it, because that's that's the thing that's going to get your message across the business. And this year at Wild West Hack and Fest, we have our fireside talks, right? 
Campfire talks. Campfire talks. And our campfire talks, I'm not joking, are literally, like I hate to say it, they're additions for next year. I'm going to sit there. We're going to watch a whole bunch of people at BHI. Well, some of them are, people. they're not all new. So no, they're, on, they're not all new. <laughs> no, no but, we have like, we have some new people doing that. The campfire talk was basically, we could cram more talks into our event. So that's they're, what we they're lightning talks. They're, they're lightning not all talks. brand new people. But it's though. a great opportunity, it right? You get to move fast. You get to see what works. You get to see what doesn't work in a presentation. And the only way you get better at presenting is by presenting. So um, for TechNet evaluations, you can download those from Microsoft. On the networking side, you can set up an entire network lab at home, and you should be trying to set that up. Uh, there's a whole bunch of simulators. I gave you a link that you can pull down in the slides, or you can just find some old gear. Uh, we actually are buying all kinds of gear all the time. I have testers that will be like, hey, I found this voting machine that's on sale on eBay for $20. John, can I buy it? I'm like, absolutely. We want to take that apart. Uh, David Fletcher. David Fletcher has got, and Rick, David and Rick have got to have just garages filled with electronic crap uh, that they buy all the time and they constantly fiddle with it. They're always like, can we, Sierra, can we buy this new piece of thing for Wild West Hacking Fest? Yes. <laughs> Approved. Make, make that happen. <laughs> and Randy talked about the aptitude. If, if it's not just coding, I think it's that curiosity, right, Randy? I mean, we don't, we don't have a lot of students that are coming up these days doing crossword puzzles, but it's that curiosity of finding garbage and not just simply discarding it. But it's that curiosity of finding these old equip these old equipment and stuff, just taking it apart and trying to figure out how it actually works is very much key to computer security because it isn't just enough to build something. We want to take it apart and try to understand it and ultimately breaking it is going to be part of that process. So usually with my testers, I say buy two or three because uh, you're going to end up breaking a couple of them. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, oh, that, that's true. That, that's that's absolutely true. And and in fact, not just the device itself, but how you, the process of using the device. You know, mm -hmm. again, in, in Schneier's, Schneier's little essay thing, you know, he talks about how you could probably walk up to the service department of a car dealership and after going out to the where they park the cars after they've been serviced, copy down a VIN number or license plate number, go on in and pay for it. And they'll hand you the keys to the car because they don't ask you for any type. You know, it's that type of looking at the process and seeing how things work. Yep. Uh, also, I recommend Linux install everything from scratch. You're going to be spending a tremendous amount of time uh, building Linux tools, getting Linux tools configured, getting things working like your wireless card, your fingerprint reader, everything. But all of that struggle that you go through, I, I, I get a little sad whenever I talk to prospective interns. And I ask about Linux, and they're like, well, you know, I could install Linux, but, you know, it's just crap, and it doesn't work, and all my stuff didn't work, so I just gave up, and I went back to Windows or a Mac. It, it, don't begrudge them, right? You can't be mad about that because there's some value in what they're saying, but it doesn't reflect the types of qualities that we're looking for and that we, we want someone to work for us. We really, really, really like people where, you know, I, I started, you know, building the Linux kernel from scratch and trying to install all the software from scratch. Um, not just using a distribution like Ubuntu, but trying to build all the stuff from the core level and some jump note with computer. That is a massive like flag for us to say, hire this person, because they're not trying to make their life easy. They're trying to make it exceptionally difficult for the purposes of trying to learn. So a bit more specific, bash scripting. Uh, Randy may disagree with me on this one. There are other shells, but Bash is the one that you're going to end up using more than just about any place else. So please, please, please start learning the ba basics of Bash scripting. I think, Sierra, we have another question. Um, yeah, so just back up to your um, conversation about Linux a little bit. When, yeah. you, when you say learn Linux fundamentals, do you what do you mean? Do you mean understanding how it works? And the basics of where everything is that you can run basic commands or that you should know, know how to do it blindfolded. I would say yes to all of it. <laughs> okay. Um, and the only way that you really get that good to where you can actually do it blindfolded is by struggling and trying to get things to work that generally shouldn't work. Yes. Um, and it's just basically dig in. And I always tell people too, like we had one person that wanted to be an intern, just uninstall Windows. Uh, a couple of magical things are going to happen, although it's changed recently. If you uninstall Windows, just install Linux as your core OS, your world is going to get a little bit more difficult. It is, but you're going to learn a tremendous amount in doing so. The other thing is it's going to close off a lot of paths for you. You're not going to have the path open to you for playing video games, even though Steam now has a tremendous amount of functionality on Linux, which made me cry a little bit inside. But you're, you're going to be focused on using that operating system rather than just simply playing video games on it. And I'll talk more about video games later. So there's a couple of books. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I just want to reinforce what what you're talking about because you know the ability to 
build it from the ground up, you've got to be able to connect those dots because troubleshooting, I know they say it can't really be taught, but if you can do the basic troubleshooting of, okay, this isn't working, why? What came before it? Did it load? Did it work? You know, is it getting power? When you start trying to go through and reverse engineer or functionally decompose a system, you're going to have to understand what's connected to what, connect those dots and follow it backwards. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I kind of have a thing I talk about in SANS classes. Uh, the basics of troubleshooting are ping, port, parse. If you have any tool or anything that's not working, can you ping the system you're trying to communicate with? If you can't, your problem is the network or it's not plugged in. Uh, then you have port. Is the port of the remote service I'm trying to talk to available? And you can check that with like an Nmap scan, just basically making sure the port is accessible. There's no firewalls, it's, the service is actually running properly. And then parse is take all of the error messages that are being provided to you and actually read them and try to understand them, go to Google, or the logs that are being generated from that particular application, try to read them and understand them. If you can kind of work through the idea of ping port parse, you're gonna have a much better time trying to troubleshoot, but you're gonna have to learn how does networking work to understand pinging and port. You're gonna have to understand operating systems because you're gonna have to understand how, how do you query an operating system in Windows, uh, netstat minus NAOB or LSOF space minus lowercase i space minus capital P. You're gonna have to learn the operating system ways to communicate and actually work through ping port parse properly. But having that basic operating system knowledge, getting started in that operating system, struggling with that operating system is going to give you the key fundamentals that you're going to need to move forward with troubleshooting. Because Ed said, you can't teach someone to troubleshoot, but people can learn. And it's something they have to do on their own. Is that kind of a good reflection of what you just said, Ed? You said it better than I did. Thank you. <laughs> so where can we go to learn coding? Uh, I would like to open this up as well. We have some people as well that maybe they want to share some links too. But learning Python online and going to like Code Academy, Code Academy is fantastic. I use it for high school students whenever we do high school coding classes. I think it's great for professionals. At Black Hills Information Security, if we have someone that wants to make a transition into uh, doing pen testing from systems administration or uh, some type of development, um, if they want to learn a language, we always throw them to Code Academy, and I want them to get all the way through a specific lesson plan uh, before they move on to different activities in the company, be it development, be it R&D, and so on. And their, their classes that they have are amazing. They have Python, they have standard web classes, they have Ruby, they have all these different languages that you can learn. And I think Python's the best place to start because it's it's got very strong syntax in it. But other languages are important as well, like ASP.NET, C Sharp, and so on. You're gonna be using a wide variety of different coding languages to actually do your job. So Learn Python is, uh, online is great. There's another one, Code Warrior, I think, where you'll learn how to code a video game online. And hopefully we have some people that have shared some other things uh, that have popped up. Pluralsight, um, I think, is another good one. Anyone else come um, up with some good recommendations as well? They agreed with Code Academy and Pluralsight. And uh, someone else mentioned codingbat.com slash Python. Codingbat.com forward IT slash Python. IT Pro TV, uh, Cybrary, Free Code Camp, Safari Books Online, Cyprary, <laughs> Hack This Site. So Udemy. Yep. Uh, so. Academy, I think is what, how it is. So, so there's a lot out there. So find something that works for you because Code Academy may not be the best approach for you. You may need something else. Go find that. And this is a great place to start in high school. We originally did this for college students as well. But the response that we got from people that are IT security professionals that were just looking for some place to get started was overwhelming at our conferences. So that, that helped out quite a bit. Uh, year one, next generation. Uh, gentlemen, I'm throwing in the 20 critical controls. I, I think if you want a good overview of computer security, you can spend a lot of time in the CIS documentation for individual operating systems, but the critical security controls giving you a great overview of what technical controls need to be in place and how to implement those controls is something I should have hit in the first time, the first time I ever did this webcast. Uh, the 20 critical controls are important for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is um, it gives you a clearly defined set of objectives what those objectives look like, and then also mapping. I'm gonna throw it over to Ed first, because I know he's done some auditing on this. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, and I'm gonna open up an Excel, a couple of Excel spreadsheets here in just a couple of minutes. So Ed, what are your thoughts on this as well? Good, it's, it's a good place to start. The other thing that I like about it, John, is it's a structured way to start looking at 
the universe of security that also, you know, I keep coming back to the central tenant, brings in a little bit of what the business is looking for and what part you play in it. Because to your point, you can be a tech god, and if you don't know why it's important that you're a tech god, it's not going to help you out. So I do like the top 20. And I also have to say that, and this is going to go, I know not everyone's going to want to hear this, but the aspect of auditors, there's nothing wrong with documenting things. And it is good to be able to go through a system and understand if I'm expected to review a system for security, what am I looking at? What am I looking for and why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the why behind it is huge. Um, so this, these are a couple of uh, scripts that are available from Enclave Security Audit Scripts, who's since beefed up their web server since the last time we did a webcast and we Sweet. gave them the BHIS hug of death. <laughs> we um, actually haven't done that in a long time. We haven't done that in a while. We haven't brought any sites down in a long time. <laughs> but it breaks down each of the critical controls, what it is you're supposed to do. And there's a lot of documentation online of, as to the why, why you need to do these different things. And, you know, like basically inventory of software, inventory of hardware, continuous vulnerability management, understand what this is. So it, it's been interesting. My brother is just now starting to take his journey into information security. He's came on and he's joined us and he's helping us out with a lot of different things. And for me watching him, try to find that place to like gravitate and latch on to. It was interesting how quickly he gravitated to the critical security controls and is just kind of becoming a monster in information security very quickly because he's going through each one of these controls, developing a better understanding of what these controls actually mean, the why behind it, and then also implementation strategies for each of the critical security controls. I think that that was huge for him and to actually see that from the eyes of somebody that is just getting started in computer security and the value it's brought to him in particular is incredibly important. Also, one of the people you're gonna run, groups of people, and Ed and I have talked about this quite a bit in computer security is uh, sometimes you'll be dealing with security pro that'll always bring up a certain obscure audit compliance standard. Like they'll basically be like, well, according to the Canadian CSE top 10, and you're like, I don't even know what they're talking about. And the critical security controls has a Rosetta Stone where each one of the controls is specified, and then it's cross-referenced to NIST 853, the NIST CSF, and then you get all the way over here, you got um, ANSI standards, you're going to have PCI DSS 3.0, 3.1, HIPAA, so on. This is incredibly valuable because it means you're not just learning one framework, but that framework that you're learning is directly applicable and cross-referencing over to another of other, a number of other frameworks. And Randy, on your side, I know you were there just like a bunch of us at SANS. Uh, James Tarala really took off with this and Kelly Tarala, who you know we both know and love. We've worked with him for yep. a long, long, long time. I, we, I, gotta, I gotta be honest, whenever Alan sat down with you, like he did with Ed Scotus and Eric Cole and me and Rob Lee, and he said that his solution to trying to solve the problem of audit and compliance was to develop another auditing framework. Were you a little bit skeptical at the beginning of that entire process as well? Yep, sure was. and and. Uh... Uh, the actual, it's kind of funny because the critical controls actually evolved from a, a SANS project called the uh, Top 10 Internet Threats. Mm -hmm. And this was back in the early 2000s where um, a, the, a consensus group, I was part of that group, uh, we analyzed it, the causes of attacks back then and it came down to about 10, 10 basic attacks uh, were responsible for, um, uh, you know, 80% of the successful intrusions at that time. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, this whole framework is, is really, really important. And at Virginia Tech, we are implementing the 20 critical controls uh, as, as, as our, uh, it's a bridge between the policy and the rubber meets the road type stuff. So at the high level, you got a policy it says we're gonna follow NIST 853. In the middle, you got the critical controls, which tells you what to do. The CIS benchmarks then are actually have the rubber meets the road commands. What are the actual commands that you're going to do in Linux or Windows or, or whatever to accomplish what a, a critical control requires? And that backtracks to, to the uh, standard. So that's kind of the bridge that we use the, the controls. Um, and uh, SEC 566, which is the SANS course on the critical controls and 440, um, I've been I've been teaching those with SANS that that, that course is as you said it's taken off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's I've been teaching that one pretty much constantly for the last two and a half years all over the place. 
Now, we've talked about this too, and, and Ed, jump in as well. You're going to have conversations as you're getting started down your critical, down your, your security path, right? As you get started yeah. in information security, you're going to have people that say, well, I disagree with the 20 critical security controls because they don't have enough emphasis on threat hunting, or they'll talk about some specific technology that's not in there and it's old and it's out of date. Don't listen to those people. It's not that they're wrong. They may have a technically valid argument for what they're doing. But in computer security, you're going to come across professionals that will look at something, be it 853, be it um, ISO standards, be it the critical security controls, and they'll have a couple of gripes with it, and they think they need to throw away the entire framework. When you get started in computer security, you can't go down the path of absolutely throwing out something in total because there's something wrong with it. I'd use antivirus as an example from a technical control. Antivirus can absolutely be bypassed. Does it mean it's worthless? No, it just means that it has a specific goal, objective, and limitations. And a lot of learning computer security is understanding those limitations and not necessarily throwing things away because they're imperfect, but building your architecture out of imperfect components that will reinforce and support each other. So you're going, to have, you're going to have this happen, right? You're going to have people that say, well, that's stupid for the following reasons. Don't listen to the haters. Haters are going to hate. That's what they're going to do. But if, even if they're technically correct, you need to be able to move past that and understand that with a lot of things, it's going to be about 90, 95% correct. You need to focus on that. Don't worry about maybe the 5% that is somewhat confrontational. If you are interviewing for a job for, with, with us that, and you've brought that up in your resume that you know the 20 critical controls, um, that would be a big plus. Yep. Uh, because that would tell me, A, that you, you're looking at it from a strategic standpoint and and you know then and then you you know what what needs to be done from a high level and then i can ask you more detailed questions about well how would you do this and drill down into the into the other uh you know uh, more specific commands to test your technical knowledge on that so now we're moving on to year two uh and gentlemen year two i i think what i tried to do with year one to year two transition uh, because i was very high on nyquil when i did this whole thing um, I wanted people to move from being consumers to being creators. You're a consumer of knowledge, you're a consumer of books, you're a consumer of webcasts, you're a consumer of podcasts. At some point, you have to start that process of starting Git projects. You've got to start that process of creating your own podcast, your own webcast. You've got to start that process of starting to create videos, no matter how basic. You've got to start that process, maybe learning a new coding language like PowerShell. And I don't care where you're at in your career path. If you're just getting started in your career path and you're just getting started in PowerShell and you learn something kind of cool, don't hesitate to write a blog post about it. Is that me? You or, hit it. I didn't. Did it's I? like a bell. Jeez. I didn't. Oh, it just started moving on its own. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to start creating, start sharing. And even if it's very, very basic little scripts and things that you're creating, believe it or not, there's people that are dying to try to get that information. Somebody may be doing exactly what you're trying to do. And if you can show them the way, that is amazing. So you have to start becoming a creator relatively early in your career path. You may not like some of your projects when you, when you get five, six years down the road, but you can get rid of them or you can update them. We had an intern who spent the better part of his summer redoing all of his old projects that he did to polish them up to make sure that they were ready for job interviews they were they were ready but he had projects that he was working on in high school that he hadn't touched and he's like this code is embarrassing i'm going back to fix it i'm not saying do that level of obsessive compulsiveness but it shows that type of dedication and that's someone that we absolutely want working with our company by the way you know who you are the door is always open to say you want a job and we'll be happy to hire you so ed uh, you know, about creators, you know, you coming up with the education system with me, there weren't a lot of people that were creating anything at all as part of their path in education. Mm -hmm. No, and, and you're absolutely right. It, no matter how lame you feel when you're doing it, there's going to be <laughs> someone out there who goes, oh, thank you for doing that. This has been, you know, this is a godsend. And you look at them and you go, I don't know whether to be really happy now or to be really <laughs> sad because you thought that was good. But yep. I mean, it, and it's something that you can't get better at if you don't do. Absolutely. Um, if you look back at any of your first podcasts, any of your first papers that you released, you kind of laugh and you go, and people watch that? Oh my God. But <laughs> I think Sierra coming in when we started up the, the podcast, it's like, all right, well, we got a, we got a webcast. 
She's like, what are you doing? Well, we got a folding table and we're just going to do that. She's like, are we just using the microphone in your computer? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I like pizza stains on my shirt. Still do, probably. Uh, but you, you, you You're know, always but, growing. We're always growing. But that getting growing better. is cool, right? Yeah. It's cool sometimes to look back on it and say that's where we came from and where we are today and how much better well, it is. Well, it's like with the blog that we have, you know, like the testers are always feeling a little bit impostery because we realize like the giants that are in this industry. So it's like, but I don't want to say something that someone's already said better. No, because it's that's not true. Like you yeah. are like you're saying something in a way that's going to reach somebody. Yeah, and that's, yeah, do that's, it. it's the same thing when anytime you're teaching, you know, mm -hmm. the information may not be new, but um, when you have someone I used to encourage people, it's like, look, if the person sitting next to you can explain it in a way that makes you get it better than I can knock yourself out. The point is you get the information. Yep. And the other thing that I think is critical, John, is that when you start being a creator, for good or bad, you become rapidly exposed to this thing called the public opinion. And, yeah. you know, and I think that we all have to go through that because at some point you have to be able to separate what was really good, meaningful input that might have stung mm -hmm. and what was just someone trying to be rock throwing. Yeah, trying to throw yeah. rocks. <laughs> Thank we you. So Randy, I want to throw it over to you uh, because you don't just have students that have projects, you have team projects that a lot of people are working together. Do you think that that creates a place for people that maybe don't have any creative, super awesome ideas, or they're a little bit shy, they're a little bit timid, they can kind of hook into a cool project that's working at their university, like a Virginia Tech or School of Mines and Technology here in South Dakota. It gives them a safe space to kind of get into it a little bit gentler. Like, what, what's your take? Is that different? Do you think it's just as cool for a student to say, We're, I worked on this project like our interns, I worked on the Reno project. It, do, you, do you look at that as kind of equal to each other or is that different? What's your take on larger projects that, are, that involve teams? So if you're going to go take a job in any real world company, you're going to be put in a team. And so it's, it's rare that you're going to be, uh, you know, here, do this on your own with no other resources. So you have to learn how to work in a team environment. Um, and, 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 and you have to uh, understand that the skill set uh, of your team is going to depend, is going to be all over the place. Um, Part of it too, when like for the classes that I teach here at, at Virginia Tech, I've got 85 students. I split them up into teams of four, or you know, or, or three or four, whatever the, the number comes out to be. But some someone might be a Linux expert, someone might be a network expert, someone might be a a Windows expert, and and, and you need the, that type of expertise. But you need somebody, you know, somebody's got to become a team member. Somebody's got to become the the person who's the team leader uh, and can take whatever the goals are and translate it into action. Um, uh, the lone wolf person, uh, you don't find uh, a lot of those in, in industry anymore. Um, yep. they, they have to work as a team. The other thing I do is uh, recommend, especially, and, and it's open to community college level, as well as uh, four-year institutions. We all have cybersecurity clubs and they're not all restricted to students only. Like our cybersecurity club, we take people from outside the university that can come in and 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 do stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, they meet twice a week, and one day of that uh, uh, Tuesdays, for instance, it's a it's a learning session. Uh, someone from the cybersecurity club will be teaching people how to use Wireshark, or how to use Scapy, or how to use HBing3, or any of these things. And so, that's that's, that's awesome because you talk about that. And that's exactly what I talked about on this slide a year ago. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, um, I graduated from the University of Wyoming, talked about it at the beginning of the session. And uh, the, Henry Rollins came out on a spoken word tour. Uh, Randy, I know I've told you the story. I think I yeah, yeah. told it to you when I was in, uh, we were in Singapore together. And, yeah. um, and I was in a band at the time. And we were in Laramie, Wyoming. And the gentleman up in the upper right-hand corner, his name is George Radecki. And he was the manager of SST Records, which was uh, Henry Rollins's record company. And uh, God only knows why he was in Laramie, Wyoming. And he was writing a book, a Western. And Henry Rollins got a chance to talk with him. And he was talking about the music scene in Laramie. And I'm like, he's like, so how, how's the music scene in Laramie? 
And uh, I said, it's horrible. You know, the scene here is horrible. It's just a, it's just an awful scene. And his response was basically with explosives built in. He was like, you know, make your own effing scene. And you talk about well, those. And if there's no scene, there's space for there's scene. There's space for scene, right? <laughs> and, you know, his whole thing, of, you know, get on the bus, get out there, do it, get out there, fail, have people throw beer bottles at you, <laughs> suck horribly, but just keep doing it. Um, it, it goes back to, Randy, you talk about that brown bag session where you're going to have someone that gets up and talks about Wireshark. Yeah, it may not seem like you're making a scene, but it is. It, you are making a scene. You're becoming that touchstone. You're presenting, and you just got to get out and you got to do it. If you're waiting for someone to come and hand you stuff, uh, I like. There's a whole group of people yeah. on Twitter. They're like, I'm a genius, and no one's hiring me, and I'm I, I'm so so brilliant. Nah, you, you suck in some way. Go fix it, and uh, you know, go make your own scene. Dare so, to suck. Yeah, dare to suck, and and embrace <laughs> that, the suck, right? That, that, that's what I said. I mean, I've, I've, every class I've ever taught, whether it's SANS or a tech, I've never taught a class where I didn't come back with a page and a half full of notes right. about how somebody did something different. And that's cool. That's what we, that's why we do it because it makes us better. I think you told me, I think I was, it was like the second year I was teaching with SANS. Um, I was with you and you're like, you know, you, you were so blunt, but you, you said right now you suck at teaching. And I felt like I was on the beat. I had good scores and eval <laughs> scores. And I'm like, this guy, the SANS instructor number two, right, is just blunt. And he's like, you you, you suck. And I'm like, I, I think I'm just doing, I got defensive. And I'm like, I think I've been doing pretty good. He goes, you're going to move forward 10 years from now. You're going to look back at how you were teaching and what you did. And you're going to realize just how horribly prepared you were in that long run. And that long view is something I think that was important. Um, and I just continued to suck for a long time until I finally got better at it. Um, another story, uh, year two, next generation um, uh, slide that I added in. The other thing I didn't talk about in the last webcast was part of the reason there was a huge, huge inflection point for me, even before I started teaching for SANS, I was uh, watching um, American Idol and my daughter was there and she, uh, she was trying to get my attention. She was very, very, very small and trying to get my attention as my daughter does. And I uh, was watching, I don't know, Justin Guarini or someone dance and saying, I, and I'm watching TV and I noticed that my daughter made it like all the way across the room and she had walked and I just got the opportunity to see Lauren fall at the end of the room. And I realized I missed my daughter's first steps because I was watching television. And I realized I was failing as a father, I was failing as a husband, I was failing as a human being because I was replacing things that are real with this crap on television. And it fundamentally changed me. And that's whenever I started sinking in, I got Sanser, CISSP, and started learning and breaking Active Directory and started this whole path of doing pen testing back in 2000, 2001, 2002 timeframe. It was a fundamental change and a shift for me to start switching away from those things. And that that failure and realizing that I was failing was huge. Now, I took the television, I'm not joking, we actually had our television on a cart. We could wheel the television around, bring it out of the closet, set it up. And I, I took the television and I, I threw it away in, in the front of our house, the front of our driveway. And Erica, my wife came home and she's like, why is the TV out in the driveway? I'm like, I threw it away. Uh, just like poltergeist, just threw it out and I was done with it. And that point for like the next six months, I was able to sink into computer security and it became everything to me. Uh, it was what I was reading in my spare time. I was working on things constantly. I was building virtual machines and real Linux systems and breaking stuff. And it was annoying, but I, I created a void in my life and I filled it with something else. And that was huge. Now, I don't want to be that ass that's always like, so I don't have a TV and it frees me from the shackles of consumers, capitalist society, <laughs> and it makes me an infinitely better person than you. Because I got to be honest, Game of Thrones is awesome. Um, what's the other show? Westworld is great. I just got done watching um, Iron Fist season two, which is infinitely better than Iron Fist season one. But one of the things I recommend to people, I used to just say, shut it off, shut off video games, shut off absolutely everything. But now I kind of moved to go through phases, go through a month where you disconnect and you just focus in on something and then come out and then the next month, go ahead and watch things, right? Create those spaces, but create long stretches. Don't ever be like, well, today, between the hours of seven and nine, I'm gonna study security, then from nine to 10, I'm gonna watch. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, create a month. 
So if you notice, I haven't been doing a whole lot on Twitter lately. I um, have been really sinking into right here. I've been sinking into blockchain. <laughs> uh, I've been sinking into cryptocurrencies and blockchain at the behest and uh, kind recommendations of Bull Bullock, Daft Hack on Twitter, and uh, You Stay Ready, uh, Mike uh, Felch on Twitter. They, they've been doing a lot with this, and they kind of turned me around. I was like, blockchain is crap. It's a whole, it's a buzzword. It's on our buzzword board. But basically, like, no, there's something there, and I've decided to sink into it. Because if somebody like Bo or Mike comes up to you and says, no, there's something there, you're not like, well, they're idiots. They're smarter <laughs> than I am, right? So I'm sinking myself into it, and if you watch my Twitter like stats, it's like, whoop, bam, and it just kind of dropped off. <laughs> So I'm setting up these times where I can just do something technical and then I can come out of it. And then I can do something technical and I can come out of it. Um, but that may be different. So Ed, what do you do to try to keep up with things in security? Is it just like slow and steady or do you set like these deep, depunctured articulum points where you just kind of grow your career as fast as you can? How is it working for you? Um, mostly fits and starts. You know, <laughs> you end up having these incredible periods where you realize, oh my God, I'm laying my, uh, uh, I can't do this anymore. And you dig in real hard and you get yourself back up to a level where your work is good. You feel connected to the, the rest of the InfoSec community. I can actually listen to a John Strand podcast and understand most of the words, um, you know, and then you get <laughs> distracted by making a living. You get distracted by earning a living, spending time with your family. Yep. And then, yeah, you wake up, um, fill in the blank months or years later and realize, oh, my God, it's that time again. And so I tend to go, you know, kind of in the business cycles, you know, there's a you're at the trough, you bust ass to get back up to the top and get at the top of your game. And then you get busy playing the game only to realize oh, it's time to start getting back at the top of the game. Yeah. Um, I wanted to move on to year three. We're kind of running a little bit behind. Uh, year three, it's the year of web apps. Learn a web development language. And I don't, uh, Randy, I'd like to get your take. I think that learning Python, learning Ruby, learning C, C Sharp, I think that is all fundamental. But the way the world is today is it's all interconnected, right? Web technologies, APIs, Android apps, iOS apps. If you're going to be a viable candidate for a job in the next 10, 15 years, you're gonna have to know some web development uh, just to be able to talk the talk in information security. If you're an auditor, you've got to be able to talk ASP.NET to be able to talk about what problems were found and how the solutions actually work, communicating effectively from like OWASP and their recommendations. I think you have to learn a web language. Do you guys agree or not? This just seems like it's really important these days. For an this auditor, I don't think you have to. Uh, I don't think you have to learn it at at that detail. Mm -hmm. But from a from a, a blue team uh, type person, uh, uh, most definitely you want to have somebody who's got some sort of web app skills, um, uh, you know, to to do the, any of that type of stuff. Same thing with database. I mean, you need somebody who who knows, you know, uh, Oracle, MySQL, or or uh, whatever. Uh, you want to have those type of specialists, uh, you know, involved. Uh, cyber defense is is, you know, I mean. You, your industry, you, where you guys are with Black Hills, you're in a very niche, uh, uh, a specialized skill area from, in terms of what the overall corporate world looks for. I need people with your skills, uh, you know, from from that that everybody at, at Black Hills has. But I'm not going to use them to attack other sites or do pen tests even on myself. I'm going to hire you to defend my organization, and mm -hmm. so. Uh, learning how to take, I mean, you have to learn offensive skills before you can become a defensive specialist. And I think that's what you're saying here is you have to learn some of these languages. You have to learn some of these tools. You have to learn how to break into something. And then I'm going to flip it on you as if you come work for us, you know, say, okay, you have to defend a network that's wide open, doesn't have a border firewall, has 55,000 host based firewalls, and and has to and the business model is we have to be able to go anywhere on the net. Start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to hit that like deer in the headlights moment where right. you're basically like, I have no idea what Randy just said. I wrote down a bunch of words. I need to go look those words up. Uh, you, you want to be able to hit the ground running. Right. And that's why uh, year four, you started talking about the slide too. 
year four start trying to hack stuff and there's people that disagree with me like they're like start right away whatever I, you know however you want to approach it is fine it doesn't bother me but i think that at some point in your career you develop the technical skills where you can start taking things apart and learn ida learn immunity debugger pick a protocol any protocol read the rfcs for that protocol dissect that protocol and wireshark understand how that thing works from tip to tail not necessarily because that protocol is going to be you know key to your entire career but dang just getting started to learn how to approach a protocol and to take it apart and have those skills to do that again for another protocol is going to be huge and there's lots of online challenges and stuff and if you notice, I haven't talked about Metasploit much. I think Metasploit is always there, right? I don't, I don't think Metasploit is something that you, you, you know, spend the first two years learning. I think that by this point in your, in your five-year plan, those Metasploit modules make sense. Like how the exploit works, how do you set up different uh, memory locations for different language packs? And what are those memory locations for bypassing or at least checking data execution prevention? What do those actually mean? Where are they? I think that you're going to be at a point where you can start approaching that type of hacking framework with a much better understanding and respect than you would be if you're just running the exact same exploits again and again and again. And also, uh, is that one, a, one, yeah, of go ahead. That, one of the things that you, I would encourage everybody to read is um, Aleph One's paper on, on buffer overflow, mm -hmm. uh, that exploits that came out in 96. Um, <laughs> that, that, that was the seminal paper for, for, basically all the buffer overflow attacks that have happened since then. And, and so it's a great, great paper to read. And I had a student, Randy, that said, well, that paper's old. Buffer overflows are dead. Heap overflows are where it's at. Okay. But the concept of overflowing a buffer, the concept of th that are covered in that paper on how memory management works and how things are moved around with different functions and, uh, you know, like string copy functions and uh, null terminator strings and things like that. Those things are still there. That, that you know, the core of your operating system is still the same. And the core problem of a buffer or a variable in memory that accepts more data than it should is a fundamental problem that's not just associated with buffers, but can also transcend into the heap as well. So I agree. I think that that's a great place to start, right? I mean, you're, you're going to say, well, we're going to find lots of buffer overflows. Yes, buffer overflows absolutely still happen. We still, do, still, see, still see developers using get S in C. That still happens as a thing. Now they may have goatees and really, really amazing mustaches, but they're still making the same mistakes that were done back in the 80s. So I agree. Every That's single, it. yeah, every single attack that we've seen in the last 10 years, the, the DDoS attacks. Oh, DDoS. Look at Mixter's paper from the early 90s. Yep. Any type of buffer overflow. Oh, you got a SQL injection. Look at those papers from the early 2000s. I Learn mean, that history. Learn that history because those attacks are still being used. Why are they still being used? Because we still haven't fixed them. <laughs> well, and they, they show up again and again. Like you remember uh, IIS directory traversal where you could basically oh, yeah. do your directory traversal attack and then you switched it to Unicode and it worked again. That yep. exact same technique was used by Ed Scotus and Tom Liston for the virtual machine escapes. They basically encoded their commands in a way that the hypervisor couldn't understand and uh, it allowed it through because it didn't recognize it. Now, granted, that's an old school attack, but knowing how that attack works will give you that idea of how things break. You're going to find those limitations. Um, also, year four, next generation, start digging into the MITRE attack techniques matrix. Dig deep. Every single one of the techniques up here, if you click on it, it gives you detailed information on how that attack actually looks and the different commands that you can do to exercise that. Now you're gonna start working with these different attacks and you're gonna come up with ways to automate. You're gonna come up with ways to obfuscate. Now you're starting to look at the attacker methodology and this is all from the perspective of exercising and making Blue Team better. And then finally, the SANS pen test poster, a great place to start for cyber ranges. On the right-hand side and where it's orange, these are all websites and virtual machines that you can play with. And then five, year five, short and easy, wanna get this thing done on time, present anywhere, and everywhere. Randy had mentioned earlier, get out for brown bag sessions where people are just talking computer security topics, present on something that you just learned, uh, TCP dump filters, Wireshark filters, it doesn't matter, get out there. And all of these cons, like if you're talking DerbyCon, Wild West Hackenfest, we have our fireside uh, chats, we have all of these different things for new speakers and ShmooCon and DEFCON have those as well. So take advantage of those and get out there. 
And in closing, I've got kind of a breakdown of things that you should do and you should not do, and you can ignore everything on this list. We're really, really running low on time. I think we have time for a couple of questions, Sierra, no, or do we, we want to shut it we down? We don't, we don't. We don't. Um, I, you guys had so many questions, so many things. I guess one question that I kind of saw a few times was, is this just for students? And I, no. I want to reiterate that this is not like a, this is not just a, like how to go from high school to being a pen tester. It's also like how to maybe switch career tracks. Maybe you want to go from being like a blue team to the red team, or like you just want to get into this, industry like a little bit more and understand that is, is yep, that right absolutely and i think that that was our mistake that w the way we set it up our first webcast right it was couched towards high schoolers and college students interns and interns <laughs> right and then all of a sudden we had all these people that were in the industry and they're like look i've been in security for five years <laughs> and i feel like i'm treading water and i'm sinking and i don't know how to make my career progress we realized this was applicable for professionals as well yeah so I want to say thank you to uh, Ed and Randy for coming on to the webcast and people that had an amazing impact on my career, my trajectory. Um, I hope they helped you as well. Thank you so much and we'll see you at the next webcast. <laughs>